Okay. Uh, welcome everyone uh, to my to this class. Uh, my name is Jonathan O'Donnell. I am a postdoctoral researcher at University College Dublin in Ireland. Uh, today I'm going to be presenting uh, the, the lecture on Welding Hell, American Demonologies of Race and Empire. Uh, this talk is mostly based on research that is in my forthcoming book uh, that I'll talk about a bit maybe at the end. Um, as a general overview, uh, I'm going to be splitting the class into two halves, or rather two thirds and then a final third, uh, with a break um, after the first part for questions and then a kind of a question and answer session at the end as well. Um, so uh, without further ado, I'm going to start sharing screen. Okay, so. Um, so yeah, that's my, that's my Twitter handle, if you want to, to follow me on, on Twitter. Uh, okay, so just to start off with, uh, I'm going to have some content warnings, because we're going to be dealing with some pretty heavy stuff in this lecture. Um, so content warnings specifically for anti-blackness, Islamophobia, anti-indigeneity, settler colonialism and imperialism broadly, and a small amount of homophobia, although that won't be the kind of chief focus of the class today. Uh, but I'm just going to kind of give you a warning that these are going to be the kinds of topics that we're going to be dealing with. So, to begin with, uh, my research generally um, focuses on what, I, what is generally known as spiritual warfare, and specifically spiritual warfare demonology, that is discourse about demons. Uh, so, to move on to part one, um, I will be coming back to this image, like maybe not directly, but uh, metaphorically later. Uh, just as a kind of overview, this is an image of what is called the 1040 window within uh, spiritual warfare discourse. It's specifically the area between the 10th and the 40th lines of latitude that encompasses North Africa, a bit of Southern Europe, uh, the Middle East, and East Asia and Southeast, Cent uh, South, Cent South, Southeast and East Asia. And we're kind of talking about what this represents uh, in a bit. First, I kind of want to talk about spiritual warfare itself. Like, what is it? Where does it come from? Where does it develop? So, spiritual warfare is a discourse that is present from very, very early in Christianity. Uh, it's particularly big in both late antiquity and then later again in early modernity. Um, which is the period that is often referred to as the kind of the witch craze or the witch hunts. Um, spiritual warfare is a paradigm that presumes a number of key points. Uh, the first being, and perhaps most foundational, being the, real the literal reality of the spirit world. Um, so there is a spiritual reality that intersects with and underlies um, the material reality. This is the realm of angels and demons. Um, and it is a site of intense spiritual conflict. Uh, these two forces, uh, the forces of the divine and the demonic, are conceptualized as being at war within this particular space. Um, yeah. In one of the most uh, key defining aspects of spiritual warfare that I often come back to is from uh, this book by Francis Frangipane, uh, who was a spiritual warrior um, writing at the tail end of the Cold War. And he defines spiritual warfare fairly succinctly as a conflict over who gets to define reality, heaven or hell. This is the kind of definition that we'll be coming back to a few times kind of throughout this class. Um, but this is the kind of fundamental principle in spiritual warfare. It's the battle over perhaps hegemonic or ideological or general like social constructions of reality uh, defined in spiritual terms. Uh, yeah, the, one of the principal aspects of spiritual warfare is this idea that the spirit world underlies and influences the material world. Uh, this is particularly crucial. Um, generally, within spiritual warfare, like um, the, physical, the material world is, ref is considered a kind of epiphenomena of this underlying spiritual reality. It's often kind of modeled uh, by some scholars on the kind of base superstructure model. Um, so the uh, dimensions of the spiritual war uh, that underlie this conflict uh, influence the material world, conditioning everything from, say, individual mental health to family dynamics to uh, poverty in a specific area, um, all the way up to the kind of rise and fall of nations 
Um, this is a kind of broad spread. Uh, demons within this framework are conceptualized as being fought through a combination of ritual action and kind of political material activism. Uh, in terms of ritual, specifically prayer is often the kind of key focus. Uh, spiritual warriors engage in what they see as a kind of militant or weaponized form of prayer uh, that is used to kind of identify and then drive out demonic influence from specific locations. We'll talk a bit more about the concept of territoriality that this is kind of working with fairly shortly. Um, a lot of these beliefs, both the, the methodologies for prayer like and kind of reports of uh, battles that war spiritual warriors engage in, are reported through a series of spiritual warfare manuals uh, that is a kind of genre of literature that is very prominent uh, within the specific subculture uh, that inform and instruct believers on the reality of the demonic realm and the tactics used uh, to engage with it. Uh, the books that I have kind of are four examples of spiritual warfare manuals. Um, manuals generally fall on a broad spectrum um, from, on the one hand, a kind of pure self-help type book that's focused primarily on the individual or the family, uh, and on the other end, uh, a kind of more like a conspiratorial track that will focus on world politics, uh, national politics, uh, institutional power. But the underlying um, worldview that kind of underlies these frameworks is ultimately the same. It's this idea that uh, the spiritual world and specifically the demonic aspect of the spiritual world is an underlying influence on material reality, whether that is the individual or like the national whole. Uh, Forbidden Gates, this book here, is uh, on the more conspiracist end of this discourse. Um, the other three fall uh, not necessarily in the middle, but kind of between these two poles. Uh, a, good, a good example of this uh, is The Hidden Enemy by Michael Youssef, uh, which is depicted there. Um, as you can probably tell from the subtitle, um, the book claims to be about the aggressive secularism and the threat of, of radical Islam. Um, however, um, as the book uh, plays out, the twist is that the titular hidden enemy within this text is not actually either of these things, but is in fact the sinfulness of humanity as a whole, and specifically um, American people. Um, who have given into sin and therefore opened themselves up to the demonic threat that he is figuring as the forces of aggressive secularism and radical Islam in this context. Um, so that's the kind of, the other two books, both Stealth Attack and Lucifer's War, I'll be talking about a bit more in the second part of this lecture. So I'm going to kind of leave those for now. Uh, but they operate similarly in the sense of this interweaving of uh, the individual and the kind of collective or the national whole. Um, so before we get to kind of interrogate these things in more detail, I want to kind of talk a bit about the territorial nature of spiritual warfare demonology today, and specifically the um, territoriality of what is known as the third wave of spiritual warfare. Um, spiritual warfare is an outgrowth of um, generally kind of Pentecostal or charismatic modes of contemporary Christianity. Um, to give a kind of brief history, uh, Pentecostalism uh, was seen as emerging in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, often specifically in America and the Azusa Street Revival of 1907. Um, however, it has been traced by scholars to a kind of more global um, origin rather than specifically American one. Uh, Pentecostalism generally um, is a form of ecstatic Christianity. It is particularly uh, keyed around the idea that God bestows um, spiritual gifts on the believer, um, known as charismata. Um, it's where charismatic comes from in this context. Uh, these gifts can be anything from kind of say more mundane or less supernatural gifts like leadership, for example, uh, or authority. Uh, but it can also include what we might consider more supernatural elements like uh, the ability to speak in tongues, um, faith healing, and the, the one that I'm going to be focusing on more, which is the ability to discern 
and then uh, deliver people and places from demonic influences. Um, the initial uh, Pentecostalism is sometimes referred to as the third wave in these, uh, not the third wave, the first wave in these discourses. Um, and it was notable because uh, it wasn't necessarily part of existing uh, Christian denominations. In fact, it like generally formed its own um, organizations and its own structures, uh, the Assemblies of God being probably the most famous and the most global of these. Um, this changed after World War II uh, when you started getting uh, Pentecostal modes of Christianity developing more uh, prevalently within existing Christian denominations uh, like the Baptists or the Episcopalians or the Presbyterians like in America. Uh, this is sometimes referred to as the period of charismatic revival um, or within this taxonomy as the second wave. Uh, the third wave then, uh, which is an, an internal terminology, it's a terminology used by um, third wave evangelicals, develops kind of in the mid 1980s, um, particularly tied to the writings of a series of evangelists uh, such as Peter Wagner, um, Cindy Jacobs, uh, Eddie and Alice Smith, Rebecca Greenwood and others. So, uh, and this form of spiritual warfare, this third wave, uh, is often tied to what is sometimes called neo-charismatic, uh, which is to say charismatic, charismatic or Pentecostal individuals that are generally seen as post or non-denominational and are particularly focused on evangelizing specific modes of Christianity uh, rather than say founding specific denominational churches, uh, which had been the focus in kind of previous eras. Uh, spiritual warfare being very central uh, to this particular mode. And they're also kind of very well known for their uh, promulgation of a very specific kind of territorialized demonology. So within this demonology, uh, demons are seen as controlling space and specifically kinds of space. Uh, these, these spaces can vary. Uh, they include houses, uh, famous landmarks, um, cities, nations, sometimes even whole continents. Um, Generally speaking, the larger the area, the higher the number of demonic forces that will be seen as exerting control over these spaces. Um, so a continent or a nation will be seen as having multiple demons kind of working in collusion um, to subjugate this particular area. Uh, a house whereas might just have a single entity in it or a group of lesser entities. Um, this territorialized demonology um, ties very closely into the idea that possession or oppression, um, demonic oppression, is highly related to ideas of legitimate ownership, of who gets to own specific territories and spaces. Um, the notion of possession or oppression here is kind of crucial because there is a common theme within a lot of these spiritual warfare manuals that demons cannot possess um, either people or specifically Christians. They often kind of waver on this particular point. In the case of the latter, the idea is that by converting to Christianity, um, the individual has essentially signed a property contract with God that gives God legal ownership over their personhood. And because of that legal ownership, demons are not able to possess uh, that particular individual um, or at least not allowed to possess them legally. And that ties into the idea that demonic control of space is framed through ideas of illegality. Uh, as Rebecca Greenwood here writes, uh, demons hold territory illegally acting as illegal squatters. Uh, There's a specific image of the squatter that runs through a lot of this demonology uh, that predates the third wave specifically and is traceable at least to Billy Graham and possibly earlier. Um, but the idea here is that demons um, hold territory without like full legal ownership. In the case of the individual, the idea here is that through sin or through um, various actions, um, God has kind of absented the individual, like leaving them open to demonic influence. Uh, therefore, the demons kind of move in as squatters while the kind of legitimate owner is absent within this context. Yeah. Um, 
this general framework is very much tied to the idea that control by demons, uh, territorial control by demons, is tied to a series of misfortunes or systemic issues. Uh, this can include uh, widespread poverty, uh, widespread violence, uh, and or also environmental disasters. And we'll kind of see some examples of this discourse kind of play out throughout this lecture in the examples that I talk about later. Um, but how do demons get influence over places, particularly places that are supposedly owned by divine authority? Um, this is often related to ideas of sin. Um, within spiritual warfare discourses, uh, sin, either individual personal sin or collective group sin, either in terms of kind of a national whole or in terms of, say, like a familial pattern of behavior, uh, will be seen as opening up um, those individuals or the spaces they occupy to demonic influence. Uh, these sins vary widely. Uh, for example, a battlefield uh, or former battlefield will often be framed through ideas of the sin of bloodshed or murder or violence. Uh, the idea that the kind of the violence committed in that place against other humans has kind of tainted the area and opened it up to the possibility of demonic control. Uh, kind of typical haunted houses or things like that might work through this kind of structure. Um, however, one of the more common sins uh, that is uh, constructed is the idea of idolatry. Uh, idolatry here specifically referring to non-evangelical Christian forms of religiosity. We'll be talking about several um, examples of this throughout this class. Uh, specifically non-evangelical because Catholicism is also sometimes included um, depending on the author within the structure. Uh, specifically forms of Catholicism that they uh, that the writers vehemently disagree with, such as say the transcentrality of Mary or uh, the veneration of saints, for example. Um, yeah, uh, this last one is particularly crucial. Um, the idea of deliverance from demons is tied to an idea of both the reclamation of space and of time, or at least a restoration of time. Uh, this is tied specifically to notions of dominion that are operating within these discourses. Uh, for example, um, dominion is often seen as tied back to Adam and the dominion that God gave to Adam in the narrative of Genesis over the earth. Uh, the idea here being that through and but then due to the fall demons gain influence over the material world uh, the space of fallen creation uh, the narrative of exorcism or of deliverance here is then seen as kind of a reassertion of that original kind of edenic concept of dominion a kind of restoring of a space to a kind of pre-lapsarian existence uh, that kind of precedes the fall either literally or more often metaphorically uh, but we're talking specifically about the temporal dimensions of uh, the way that these demonologies work um, throughout this class. So, one of the key aspects within spiritual warfare is that demonologies are exceedingly plastic, adaptable, and indeed perfectible. Uh, this is perhaps in contrast to early modern uh, or earlier forms of demonology where, for example, the exorcist would attempt to discern the demon's name um, in the demons that were possessing an individual, then they would locate that demon through their name within an existing taxonomy of demonic forces. If you look at kind of early modern demonologies, for example, they'll be full of taxonomies of, say, 72 demons, or with very specific ranks and hierarchies who then control a number of kind of legions of their own. Um, this general form of kind of heavily taxonomical or at least like fixed taxonomical form of demonology is mostly absent from contemporary spiritual warfare, uh, which tends to more a more plastic or adaptable um, form of demonology. Um, within this framework, however, each individual demonic encounter essentially operates as a form of enemy reconnaissance and data gathering. Uh, one that we'll see very shortly is very much tied up with global power relations and idea of kind of the center and the periphery, uh, specifically related to kind of constructions of US empire within um, American evangel white American evangelicalism specifically. The idea here, however, is that through, um, through the, the demonic encounter, 
the, the, the minister, the pastor, the exorcist, loosely constructed, um, is able to uh, gain knowledge and insight into the demonic realm that they can then um, fit within an ever-shifting and evolving taxonomy. Um, yeah, within the US, and within the US specifically, this is important because spiritual warfare is today a fairly global paradigm. So I'm going to be talking specifically about the way that it operates in the US or in relation to US missionary networks. Um, within the US, this process often overlaps rather strikingly with the structures of American empire, um, both historically in the sense of manifest destiny, uh, the idea of the, the westward expansion, and then later the overseas expansion of American influence, but also later in the post-war era, specifically around ideas of American global influence, American hegemony, um, and American access to resources and places. This particular structure is very crucial because of the way that third wave evangelicalism, um, the third wave spiritual warfare paradigm developed. Um, for example, like the early phases, particularly in the 1980s of the third wave developed specifically with US missionaries uh, in South America, um, off, particularly in Argentina and Bolivia, but also elsewhere. Um, and the idea here, um, one that was later expanded, is that while doing missionary work in these places, these uh, missionaries were encountering uh, local spirits, um, local belief structures that within their theological paradigm um, were demonic. And that through encountering and subjugating these entities, um, they were able to gather knowledge and gather intel uh, that they could then bring back to the United States. Um, and that particular like final point is very crucial because while there is a big overlap with discourses of American exceptionalism and American empire within these paradigms, uh, there is also a construction of America as either fallen or it falling uh, in, a, in a Jeremiadic sense that it is on the brink of disaster, potentially controlled by demonic forces. So by gathering information and demonological knowledge in the periphery, they are then able to bring that back to the center and to affect transformation kind of in the home territory. But this general missionary paradigm led to the development of what is known in third wave evangelicalism, or at least was during the 1990s and 1980s, as the 1040 window, uh, as the kind of final frontier of uh, both epistemic and material extraction in a kind of demonological sense. Uh, the image that I showed you right earlier at the start of part one of the world map, that is an image of the 1040 window. Uh, it was identified this way because within evangelical tradition, it was seen as the um, area where evangelical Christianity, perhaps Christianity broadly, but specifically evangelical Christianity, uh, was at its numerical weakest. Uh, but of course, if you look at that map, um, you can see that it overlaps heavily with um, areas that are majority Muslim, majority Hindu in the case of India, a majority Buddhist in the sense of places like Japan and areas of Southeast Asia, um, but also kind of Chinese communism or Confucianism or Taoism, like with it, you know, areas that were seen as hostile or inconducive to evangelical, evangelical uh, teachings, and therefore became this image of the kind of final frontier. Uh, yeah. As one major scholar um, of third wave evangelicalism, Rene Holvast has said, within uh, this discourse of territorialization, uh, this idea of spiritual mapping, the spiritual mapping of territories as controlled by divine or demonic forces, uh, the destiny of the Christian version of the US was manifest. And it will kind of be talking a lot more later about the specificity of this idea of the Christian version of the US, because as we'll see, alternative versions of the US uh, within this framework are framed as either um, directly demon demonically influenced or implicitly demonically influenced. These general paradigms um, join a kind of notion of soteriology to development uh, that is, and of settlement that is both spatial and temporal. 
Um, this is particularly prevalent, uh, as we'll see, in ideas of um, sort of financial success, the idea of material success. As I noted earlier, uh, there was an idea that rule by demons leads to things like systemic poverty within a specific region. Uh, within this framework, if a region is poor, then through conversion of the populace to Christianity, through reform of its structures, uh, of its institutions to be in line with the spiritual warrior's idea of biblical influence, um, then the region will have wealth kind of accorded to it uh, as a result of this kind of transformation. And, so this, and particularly in relation to the way that uh, these missionaries are often operating from the global north or particularly from the US, um, there's this idea that they are operating through a discourse of civilizing mission. Uh, they are taking, um, they are working through a framework within which development is tied very closely to soteriology. So um, I'm going to be looking very briefly now, or maybe not briefly now, but in the next few, uh, next little while, I'm going to be looking specifically at how this framework plays out in a series of th three case studies. Uh, that are all intimately related to discourses of US power and discourses of US empire. I'm gonna be looking at Japan, I'm gonna be looking at Haiti, and I'm gonna be looking at Hawaii, and the way that they incarnate kind of different modalities of this demonology that I've been kind of outlining. So, Japan. Um, due to its very specifically low number of Christians, uh, approximately 1% of the population, uh, Japan was given a fairly critical place within the third wave concept of the um, 1040 window. This was specifically in juxtaposition with South Korea, uh, where evangelicalism broadly has found kind of a broad wave of success. It's been very successful in South Korea. Um, Japan being geographically fairly close um, was therefore a bit of a conundrum uh, for these evangelicals. They were often trying to puzzle out why they thought Japan was resistant to, uh, to evangelization. And the way that they construct this uh, was through a specific retelling of parts of Japanese history and um, Japanese traditions and spirituality. Uh, specifically, uh, they viewed this hostility to evangelization as due to Japan being under a kind of reign of demonic control. Uh, but demonic control that they tied very specifically to uh, Japanese indigenous traditions, very specifically Shinto, but also to Japan's history as a closed country, uh, the history of Sakoku, uh, when um, Japan was closed off uh, for a large part from the outside world. Uh, this ties into um, general narrative that these people are telling about Japan. Uh, for example, um, before Sakoku, uh, Catholic Christianity was spreading within Japan, and then uh, the shogun Tokugawa Yasu um, closed the country, uh, pushed the Christians out, um, particularly um, Christian missionaries, uh, many of whom were Portuguese at this point in time. And the exact historical reasons for this are fairly um, complex. Uh, the narrative that's often told is because uh, Christianity was seen as too foreign. Um, that's not necessarily the case. Um, I mean, the fact that it was growing very prominent and very popular, particularly among lower classes, um, suggests that uh, it wasn't seen as that foreign, at least by the Japanese populace. Um, another, other historical reasons include there's a lot of uh, information that um, there was a problem with Portuguese slave traders abducting Japanese um, people. And the political considerations, particularly around that, were one of the main reasons that um, Ieyasu like, chose to um, push the foreigners out and close the country. But regardless of that history, um, this kind of narrative plays a very specific uh, narrative uh, position within third wave demonology. Uh, the third wave here, um, narrates this period of closure as a kind of intensification of demonic control uh, over the nation. So within their kind of demonological framework, the idea is that uh, the indigenous spiritual powers of Japan, who are framed here as demons, um, were 
angry at the spread of Christianity and therefore decided to remove the Christians and then shut down the country and kind of consolidate power. Um, and it is this consolidation um, that within their narratives accounts for why Japan is apparently very resistant to evangelization. Um, and this ends up playing out specifically in the evangelical narrative around the post-war US occupation of Japan, um, which uh, Peter Wagner, one of the kind of founders of the third wave movement here kind of frames as the seven wonderful years and quote, most serious setback to Japan's ruling spirits. The idea here being uh, specifically, this is tied to uh, the Japanese emperor's renunciation of his claim to divinity and the separation of Shinto or a specific form of Shinto from um, the Japanese state and state authority. Um, <clears throat> they don't seem to notice within this that uh, the merging of Shinto and the state within Japan happened chiefly after Western recontact and the reopening of the country rather than as a result of Sakoku. Uh, but you know that, well, maybe you let that slide for the moment. Um, specifically here though, uh, this, um, the, they see this period as the seven wonderful years, this period where Christianity kind of re-entered Japan, specifically evangelical Christianity re-entered Japan, and um, was seen as kind of gaining a large number of converts at this point. Um, and this kind of reopening to Christianity um, is seen as the reason for the Japanese post-war economic boom within their narratives. So the reason that Japan recovered so quickly after World War II um, is because of this kind of um, dethroning of the indigenous powers that they, they associate with demonic forces and this kind of reintroduction or acceptance of Christianity. However, um, for those of you who don't know Japanese, it's some of Jap Jap uh, recent Japanese history, uh, the post-war economic boom did not last. Uh, it specifically collapsed um, in the 1990s with the collapse of the bubble economy. Um, and this collapse of the Japanese economy also plays a very key role within third wave evangelical demonology of Japan. Uh, specifically, it's related to Emperor Akihito's uh, 1990 ascension to the throne and specifically his decision to perform a ritual known as the Jaijosai, uh, which uh, Emperor Naruhito, um, his son, is seen performing in this image here. Um, the Daijosai was uh, a fairly controversial ritual, like even at the time within Japan, uh, because it is a specifically Shinto ritual where the emperor uh, unites with uh, the sun goddess Amakurasu Omikami, uh, who is the kind of imperial ancestor. Um, she's the deity from which the imperial line is supposed to descend. Um, within the third wave evangelical narrative of this, however, um, his decision to perform this ritual um, reopens Japan to uh, demonic influence. It's seen as reinviting the kind of defeated demonic powers from the end post-war era back into the control of the nation. And of course, you know, it's worth, it's worth stressing again that these three forces that are being coded as demonic here are indigenous Japanese deities and spirits. They are, you know, they are, existing cosmologies within Shinto here. Um, but this uh, alleged kind of reintroduction of demonic forces is framed as causing the collapse of the bubble economy, but then even more recently, uh, the 311 nuclear disaster and tsunami. Uh, so you get this idea of poverty, uh, of environmental disaster, of, of general violence and contamination, uh, resulting from the kind of this rule by demonic power, whereas uh, a kind of dethroning of the demonic power is associated with narratives of uh, wealth, of success. Uh, and specifically here, and this is something I'm gonna be talking about a lot going forward, this relates to ideas of rupture or reversion of a kind of proper temporal order. A lot of this discourse rests on this narrative of history where you have, where you have an original state of purity kind of in, a, in an Edenic pre-lapsarian past, then gives rise to the fall. Uh, within the kind of time space of fallen creation, uh, various kind of demonic pagan 
uh, non-Christian traditions develop. Uh, but then particularly within the narrative of uh, Christianization, you have a kind of introduction of Christianity that sort of sets right the kind of temporal order. It puts creation back kind of on the right path. And specifically here, you have this idea and this coding of the demonic um, or of, of demonic, demonically coded forces as this kind of rupture in this, this proper order of time, this proper order of Christian history uh, that is as before tied to narratives of development and of prosperity and of economic success. Um, and generally the kind of frameworks of colonial modernity. So uh, I'm gonna be looking specifically at two very good examples of how this idea of the rupture of temporal order plays out within uh, this framework. I'm going to be looking at Haiti and uh, Hawaii. So uh, Haiti has long been central to American political demonologies and American sovereignty regimes. Um, the figure of the Haitian, uh, or particularly more recently, the idea of the Haitian migrant has often been figured within demonologies in US culture as a kind of figure of threat bringing a uh, disruption of those kind of spiritual and racial normative orders of US society. Uh, also, um, Haiti itself as a country has been subject to specifically like uh, the influence of broad regimes of US sovereignty, border policing, um, the idea of a sort of place that needs to be contained and uh, policed by US power and US influence. Um, one of the uh, in, interesting related facts to this is uh, the site of Guantanamo Bay in Cuba, kind of made infamous as a detention camp in the war on terror, uh, originally began as a way station um, for Haitian migrants uh, traveling to the US. Like it was, it was a kind of border, a site of border policing within uh, the Haitian context or the Haitian-American relation context here. Um, so within spiritual warfare, um, Haiti has a very specific um, relation and this ties to their narratives around uh, the Haitian revolution and the uh, emergence of Haiti as a nation state. Um, specifically, uh, the ritual that is seen as the kind of spiritual impetus within uh, Haitian nationalist narratives uh, for the revolution. Um, so the narrative goes that is very central to um, Haitian regimes of ha Haitian narratives of national origin and of genesis is that uh, several hundred slaves gathered at uh, a site named uh, Wakiman um, to perform a specific ritual um, under a leader named uh, Dutty Bookman. Uh, Bookman here is seen as invoking the spirits, so the, particularly the voodoo spirits, uh, to kind of give spiritual power and influence um, to the slaves in their revolt against French imperialism within this context. This is a very central narrative to kind of Haiti's history and to um, ultimately the success of the revolution, which gave rise to the first independent Black Republic in the Western Hemisphere. Um, however, within spiritual warfare, this narrative is perhaps equally important as it is to um, um, Haitian nationalist discourse for very, very different reasons. Um, similar to the coding of Japan, um, Haiti, the ritual here that gives birth to Haiti as a nation is rewritten as a kind of demonic pact, as a, a force of kind of demonic influence. And the way they do this is, I think, particularly interesting and particularly telling. Uh, this quote here is from Clinton Lane, who is a, an American missionary um, in Haiti, a contemporary American missionary in Haiti. Um, and he reiterates um, the ritual that is performed by Duffy Bookman invoking the voodoo spirits, claiming that uh, Bookman denounced God because he could not deliver them, that is the, the slaves from slavery. And so he gave the country to the voodoo spirits um, so that the nation would be delivered. Uh, it's worth noting here, of course, and this is something that perhaps the spiritual warriors often don't dwell on too much, um, that they are positioning um, the satanic and the demonic as the forces behind a literal slave revolt that gave rise to the first independent black republic. They are framing um, 
the demonic like as a force that would overthrow uh, French imperialism and slavery, uh, specifically because God was apparently either unwilling or unable to help them within this context. Uh, so this is the way that spiritual warriors kind of re-narrate this narrative. And specifically what this results from, and this kind of ties back to the notions of legality and illegality that we were talking about earlier, the idea that Haiti as a nation was founded through a kind of narrative of the pact, of the demonic pact. Um, and this pact, this signing over to um, the voodoo spirits, which are recoded here as demons, um, is read as the reason for Haiti's uh, poverty and penury, uh, not global power relations, not its ostracization um, by European powers due to uh, the structures of systemic racism and anti-blackness that kind of perpetuate to this day. No, it is specifically tied to this narrative of national origin and this national origin as tied to a kind of underlying spiritual essence. Uh, and this is kind of important for a variety of reasons. Um, specifically tied to the long-standing narratives of Haiti as a kind of rupture, uh, Haiti's emergence as a nation as a kind of rupture in a racial, cultural, and religious order uh, that ties back to the notions of temporal sovereignty that I was talking about earlier. Uh, so the idea here being basically that um, Haiti, like within the existing frameworks of colonial modernity, of whiteness, of kind of Christianity within the era, era uh, was essentially seen as impossible. Uh, it, was, um, it was a disconnect and a refutation of a framework which assumed, for example, that whiteness was superior to blackness, that Europeanness was superior to both Africanness and Caribbeanness. And specifically that Christianity, uh, in terms of the religious order, that Christianity was superior and had superseded like earlier non-Christian forms of religion, of religiosity and spirituality. Um, so we get here this kind of narrative of temporal rupture that is being mobilized here. Um, but also specifically uh, within the US context, as Elizabeth McAllister has pointed out in her excellent article, uh, on uh, spiritual warfare narratives of, of Haiti and its rewriting of, of Haiti's origin story. Um, this idea of Haiti as founded uh, in a demonic pact is specifically a backwards mirror image of, um, of the idea of the US as a Christian nation and as a chosen nation. The idea here being that the US, which is kind of founded in a particular image of white Christianity, uh, is, is a chosen nation and therefore its position within the global political order, um, particularly at the summit of the global political order, is a result of its chosenness, of its narrative of chosenness. By contrast, Haiti, um, within this narrative founded uh, through a demonic pact, um, is kind of given this deserved position, with heavy square quotes around that, um, as the kind of the bottom or the lowest level of uh, this kind of global order. Um, this idea that by legally signing themselves, signing the nation over, going back to the idea of legality and illegality, by like voluntarily signing the nation over to quote unquote demonic powers, um, this ensures a very specific configuration of global power relations and of hierarchy uh, that is operating to make the US's position of global supremacy naturalized and as a result of narratives of divine order. This generally plays out within broader narratives of pathologized geography, the idea of Haiti as a site of rupture, but also of corruption uh, that needs to be policed um, and um, quarantined. And this kind of plays out in a number of historical discourses. But we see this narrative also playing out um, through the demonized figure of the Haitian migrant, um, particularly within um, spiritual warriors in Florida, for example, who often position not just voodoo, but also other Black Atlantic traditions and diaspora traditions, such as Candomblé and Santeria, like as um, this kind of as carriers of this kind of rupture, like as a result, as causing things like poverty and natural disasters, like within 
uh, the Floridian context in this, in this reality. So this is a kind of narrative that the spiritual warriors tell um, in terms of demonic rupture. So I kind of want to like move and look at another example um, that they frame through this, which is Hawaii. Um, specifically, if, if Haiti is coded as a rupture, as an existing rupture within temporal order that has to be policed, um, Hawaii within this framework operates as a, a figure of the fear of rupture, this idea that rupture may occur um, in the imminent future. And specifically, this is tied to narratives of sovereignty and of kind of US political control over the area. So um, specifically within this, um, and I'm going to be drawing heavily here on a book by a Hawaiian-based pastor called Richard Ng, uh, specifically his book Spiritual Warfare, which has a uh, an entire chapter dedicated to uh, what he calls the Hawaiian religion uh, within his book. So within spiritual warfare, Ng frames uh, kingdom nationalism, that is the, the discourse that um, Hawaii should have sovereignty over itself uh, rather than being uh, subordinate to the United States, um, is, quote, a direct attack on Christianity. And he narrates this uh, framework through a narrative of um, a temporal and spatial narrative tied to conversion and soteriology. Uh, for example, he claims in this book, by 1890, 95% of the Hawaiian race was saved, but now they are returning to, quote, ancient demon religions. Uh, ancient demon religions here, um, as in the case of Japan, uh, is a stand-in for indigenous Hawaiian forms of religiosity and spirituality, um, which are being framed as a kind of, as a return or a rupture of pasts that are supposed to be past but refuse to be over. Uh, the idea here being that this kind of return of indigenous Hawaiian spirituality and of traditions uh, is something that should not occur. It is, a it is a deviation from this narrative of soteriology and development by which indigenous Hawaiians were intended to all convert to Christianity and kind of generally vanish um, as, a, as a political force. Um, it's worth noting here, however, that Ng's framing is a historical and inaccurate. Um, as scholars of um, kingdom nationalism in, in Hawaii have noted, uh, a vast majority of kingdom nationalists within um, the indigenous Hawaiian population um, are Christian. Uh, and more generally, the, adopt, the acceptance of Hawaii like, as a sovereign nation prior to annexation uh, was hinged on its adoption of various kind of Western uh, kinship and political norms. Uh, so in here is using a kind of ahistorical narrative of Hawaii. Um, but his inaccuracy is quite telling for specifically that reason. Uh, and this relates to the way that he frames um, sovereignty and particularly the sovereignty of, of Hawaii like in relation to US political power, like as this demonic rupture, like as this force of kind of demonized um, traditions reasserting control over territory. Uh, and this kind of plays out in the way that he discusses annexation and uh, the general project of US imperial power in the region generally. For example, uh, Ng claims that the annexation of Hawaii was unjust and requires the Christian settler population to ask for forgiveness from indigenous Hawaiians uh, for this act. However, this act of forgiveness is does not include any kind of material restitution or any return of autonomy uh, to the region. Um, this is a narrative that you find quite commonly in um, relations in either settler colonial or colonized or imperial territories. Um, for example, Melissa Hackman writing about South Africa and Andrea Althoff writing about Guatemala have both observed the ways that um, specifically like racialized populations are framed as the victims of demonic influence, but often demonic influence specifically tied to uh, the processes of settler colonialism. 
uh, the narrative here being that settler societies need to ask for repentance and healing from the populations they've colonized um, in order to affect a kind of transformation in the region. Um, what is particularly notable about this, however, is one that this rarely uh, entails any kind of material restitution uh, for the colonized or racialized populations, but more specifically that within this narrative of demonic influence, as I mentioned earlier, control by demons and particularly the sins of individuals that bring demonic influence cause is seen as causing things like poverty, like violence, like um, a situation of injustice. However, as these scholars have tended to note, white settler populations rarely suffer the consequences from the sins they are seen, being seen as having committed um, on these populations. Um, the results of this sin is inordinately uh, falls on the colonized or racialized populations. Uh, and this plays out within these narratives of forgiveness, this idea that um, the white settler population must ask for forgiveness but this doesn't entail any kind of material consequences and that they have mysteriously been immune um, to the consequences of the sins they're actually supposed to have committed. Uh, this also ties out within narratives of idolatry, uh, whereas for colonized and racialized groups, um, idolatry is frequently uh, focused as communal. It's often tied to ancestral affiliation, ancestral traditions. Uh, white settler communities uh, very rarely have that same framework. Uh, when idolatry is raised as a sin, it tends to be familial if it's ancestral. Uh, for example, like they might have had a grandmother who practiced witchcraft, for example. Uh, but it's a, very, it's a very personal, very familial connection, rather than these narratives which tie them to kind of broad group affiliation or historical association. Yeah. Um, so here, this narrative of absolution, uh, this idea that um, the sort of US set, uh, Christian settlers within Hawaii need to ask for forgiveness, ultimately serves as a way of enabling the perpetuation of US sovereignty and this narrative of providential temporality, this narrative of Christian control over the region as the kind of naturalized, um, naturalized cosmic order uh, that operates within these frameworks. So where does this leave us? And this is kind of getting to the end of, of part one. So within these frameworks, the demonic operates as a sign of rupture uh, within a codification of proper temporal and territorial sovereignty, uh, the proper ordering of time and the proper ordering of space. Uh, proper here is tied specifically to uh, maintenance of US power or broadly Western power as the perceived apex of a kind of soteriological and developmental world order. Um, this ties into the general framing that gives this lecture its title, uh, where I kind of start to frame spiritual warfare here as a process of colonial worlding. Um, so what does that mean? Worlding, generally speaking, within religious studies refers to the cultural and material work through which believers shape reality. And we might point back here to that earlier definition of spiritual warfare I gave uh, of, of the battle to determine reality, the way that reality is constructed. However, I'm working both with this more general concept of worlding, but also with a more specific concept of worlding that I'm deriving from uh, the work of Gayatri Chakravorty Spivak, um, where she frames worlding specifically within uh, narratives of colonization, specifically the colonization of India uh, in the context in which she's writing, but broadly applicable. Uh, Spivak frames worlding as a process in its colonial context as a process of epistemic violence, uh, one that frames the worlds, uh, the realities of the colonized as a kind of uninscribed earth that can be picked up and shaped into the world of the colonizer. Uh, and we can kind of start to think here about the earlier ways that I talked about spiritual warfare and its narrative of kind of data collection and of narratives related to the demonic and the idea of the kind of demonic um, frontier. Uh, and specifically in the examples I gave, the way that 
uh, Japan or Haiti or Hawaii and their indigenous traditions, their histories, their narratives are being processed as uninscribed earth, as data that can be properly framed and interpreted within the narrative of spiritual warfare. Uh, this ties broadly into the way that um, within spiritual warfare, non evangelical spiritual entities are real but not true. Uh, that is to say, uh, deities like Amaterasu Amikami, for example, are considered to metaphysically exist. They are entities that exist in the world. However, they are not what they claim. They are not like the, the worldviews, the narratives, the kinship systems that they embody and perpetuate are framed as demonological, as lacking kind of ontolog ontological and epistemological legitimacy. Uh, they are they operate essentially as data to be brought, to be called into the world of spiritual warfare, the welding of the world of spiritual warfare. Um, however, this process is always incomplete and always in tension because as Spivak notes in the essay in which he discusses this, the worlds of the colonized are always already more than uninscribed earth. They are already worlds. They have their own cosmologies their own histories, their own kinship structures, their own narratives uh, that they frame that are here being um, subsumed and buried within um, these, the frameworks of the colonizer, specifically of the colonizer, or specifically here within the frameworks of spiritual warfare. And the way that this plays out in spiritual warfare um, is specifically related to the rendering of the world, the concept of the world. Um, the world or the cosmos within spiritual warfare has a very specific meaning. Uh, it is the space outside of the garden. It is uh, the space in which the Christian lives, but is not part. Um, the classic phrase, the world, the flesh, and the devil, as the kind of forces that the Christian believer battles against is kind of a good example of this. The world is essentially constructed as the space in which the believer moves, but against which the believer is positioned, at which they are in conflict or at war with, particularly within the framework of spiritual warfare. Um, and the other element uh, that I'm kind of playing slightly with the etymology of hell, um, the etymology of hell literally meaning uh, the concealed, that which is beneath the earth, that which is buried. Um, as Spivak kind of notes in her essay, um, this process of welding entails a simultaneous like bringing into world and sequestering in the earth. It takes certain elements of the worlds that it's bringing up and places them within in a kind of visible, unconcealed context, but it also buries others. It buries them under the earth. It sequesters them out of sight. And within spiritual warfare, this is kind of how it works. It takes certain elements of the worlds that it encounters, these indigenous worlds, these, um, and it renders some of them as world, it rewrites some of them as world, as cosmos, like as the space against which the believer is positioned. But it also buries them, it condemns them to hell, it buries them under the earth. It invalidates their epistemologies and their ontologies uh, through this process of worlding as a kind of process of epistemic violence. And that's the end of part one. Uh, so I'm gonna take a brief break for questions and then I'm going to talk about part two and specifically the way that this general framework that I've been discussing plays out within contemporary America, within contemporary American politics, uh, specifically things like the war on terror um, and constructions of the state and ongoing protests. So, any questions? I'm just having a quick look at the chat. Um, I think. Can I ask a question? Yeah, go for it, Maddie. Oh, sorry. Um, so, uh, do you think it would be fair to say that there isn't a lot of room for nuance <laughs> um, within the epistemologies of? I'm sorry, I forgot how to refer to them. The, the third wave. Yeah, um, yeah. Sorts of people. Do you, do you, is there a way that you've found like nuance within this ideology or is it all pretty straightforward? 
I mean, it's kind of, it's both very simple and very complex. Um, on its base level, it is the reduction of, real, of all of reality to essentially a dualistic struggle between forces, uh, between good and evil, light and darkness, angels and demons. Um, within that, however, there's often a fair amount of constructions of complexity, uh, specifically the way that spiritual warriors attempt to map the demonic realm is often highly complex. Um, often tied into the intersections of institutions, of architectures, of mythologies, of folklore, of folk art, um, that all kind of contribute to uh, this ever-expanding kind of adaptive taxonomy of, of demonology. Uh, but ultimately, it is in service to a very, very simplistic um, paradigm of framing reality. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure, Tree, if yours was a question about the connection between colonialist powers and colonized places, um, but... It, it was more of a random thought, um, since when you were talking about the mm. difference in Japan and South Korea, there being uh, more people who are Christian in South Korea, and if there, it had something to do with um, South Korea having been and sort of still is a colonized country by Japan, and Japan has always been imperialistic and colonistic, specifically when it comes to the Ainu mm. oh, and yeah. Korea. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 did, I did work with, um, I did work, I, I have an article coming out, this is specifically a focused study of a particular Japanese spiritual warrior. And there's, I didn't, don't talk about it much in the article, but there's a particularly interesting incident that he relates in one of his books where he like goes to an Ainu museum and is kind of, forced vaguely to confront that, that history within Japan. Um, but to get back to your actual question, um, so the fact that Korea like, was a colonized country is actually explicitly brought up um, as to why evangelicalism was able to take off there. And like, specifically, they frame it as the idea, um, and this is actually one of those interesting frame, like, conceptual frameworks in that it shows the way that they conceptualize demonic powers is not in agreement with each other. Um, their framework is basically that the indigenous um, forces that rule Korea were systematically weakened by first Japanese imperialism uh, and then later by communism. Um, and as a result, uh, they were so weak that basically Jesus could just roll in um, unimpeded. And this is why Christianity took off there. Uh, that is the, actually the narrative that they tell. So. That's kind of what I thought, but I, since I haven't read this stuff, I was making a lot of guesses to get there. Yeah, um, it's interesting because particularly uh, within America, like demonic forces that are often very antithetical are usually framed as working in collusion, like specifically like against the United States and particularly against the idea of the United States as a Christian nation. Um, but within other nations, they're often a lot more conflictual. Um, my, my partner has a question too, actually. Oh, okay. Um, so your discussion of uninscribed earth uh, just reminds me completely of the, the old doctrine of terra nullius. Yes. Uh, uh, so, so it just seems like it's a, a, a Protestant variation of there are no Christians here. So if there are no Christians here, it's ours sort of thing. Yeah, um, very much. I, there's a whole section of the book where I talk about the way that Terra Nullius like operates kind of within this, this discourse, um, specifically in relation to kind of narratives of, um, yeah, of, of space, of particularly primordial chaos and the idea of the kind of dominion of, of territory. But it, 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 there is, there's a lot of overlap. Um, so yeah. So basically, we are totally like in sync with your book and not don't even know it. <laughs> yes, basically. Yeah, um, yeah. Maybe, maybe maybe I'm pointing in the right way and that helps. Uh, okay, so we've got a couple of questions from Chelsea and Nicole. Uh, I'm going to answer Nicole's question kind of quickly. Um, so basically, um, their views on Catholicism vary a bit. Um, Generally, they dislike it, uh, but the degree to which they dislike it varies a lot um, depending on the individual author. Um, generally, they will try and draw a distinction between 
Catholics as people and the Catholic Church as an institution. Uh, but generally speaking, they, they think Catholicism like as a system of belief like is at least somewhat demonically influenced. Um, how the degree to which they believe that like will vary immensely depending on the author, however. Um, to Chelsea's question, um, how does this jive, how does the, the metaphor of illegal ownership of a person's body and narratives about demonic possession uh, jive with attempts to convert slaves to Christianity in Europe and America? Uh, that's a really, really interesting and complicated question. Um, generally speaking, it intersects, uh, like, in terms of historically, maybe, like, that's maybe not an area I'm qualified to talk about directly, um, because I focus primarily on contemporary stuff. Uh, but there is a kind of long history, there is a long tradition, like, within a lot of these texts, particularly by white evangelicals, um, of framing um, racialized images of body ownership, um, specifically around specific racialized figures like Jezebel, um, who is framed as a demonic entity within these discourses, um, in relation to ideas of kind of illegal occupancy and bodily sovereignty and bodily integrity. Um, but the, generally there's an idea of the need to convert slaves to Christianity because Christianity was seen as docile producing, like especially in contrast to Islam or like indigenous African spiritualities that was seen as disruptive of like normative order within those territories. So there is definitely an overlap, but I'd have to probably do some deeper historical research into exactly what the connection there was. Anyone else? I'm just going to turn the light on. So. Okay. I'm going to move on to part two. So, part two. So, with a nice broken up American flag depicted here. Um, so now I'm going to be kind of looking specifically at how this, this narrative of, sort of temporal and territorial rupture, specifically one that's tied to US power, uh, plays out in more contemporary, particularly 21st century and very, very present discourses. So um, the privileging of the US within spiritual warfare frames the nation as at once invincible and yet deeply vulnerable. Um, it is at once God's chosen nation um, that is uh, destined to uh, champion Christianity globally. And yet as a result, it's deeply vulnerable to uh, co-option, to corruption, and to undoing. It is a kind of singular target of demonic forces. Um, that render it um, susceptible. Um, yeah. As, as such, as, as, the kind of, as the seat of divine authority on earth, both American power and American purity in heavy scare quotes must be maintained. Uh, that is to say, like American global hegemony uh, needs to be maintained, American global influence, uh, but also like American identity. Uh, this, and in particularly like narrative of American identity as purified, as Christian, um, and specifically as a Christianity that is very, very tied up with systems of whiteness and systems of American capitalism. Um, th these kind of structures that particularly develop uh, during the Cold War in terms of American identity um, needs to be kind of maintained uh, as a result in, in order to maintain itself as a seat of divine authority. This ties into broader uh, narratives, um, particularly uh, through which uh, threats to US empire are always framed as Neil Lahuja writes in Bio Insecurities, uh, as threats to the entire world, to humanity itself. Um, as we kind of notice from the, like, we see this in a lot of popular discourse, the way that America is 
position as a metonym for humanity or for global interests generally. But this plays out in a number of ways, like both that the interests of American citizens are the interests of um, people globally, uh, but more generally in the way that American interests, uh, polit political interests and material interests across the globe are positioned as um, the interests of humanity. Uh, this is particularly prevalent um, after the advent of unipolarity, like after the end of the Cold War, when America kind of becomes uh, the global hegemon, like the, the chief principal power globally. Uh, and this is an interesting element like within spiritual warfare discourse, because this is also the era where the third wave is rising to prominence, is becoming particularly influential. And it intersects with this kind of broader expan global expansion of US power and US influence after the Cold War. Um, what you'll often get here is a blurring between narratives of divine omnipresence, of the idea of God as simultaneously in all places at once, um, with narratives of the, uh, the global reach of US power, um, in the way that divine authority and US political influence become uh, increasingly blurred uh, within these discourses. Uh, this is ties in, and this general framework ties in to what Nikhilpal Singh in his book, Race in America's Long War, refers to as America's imperial statecraft. Um, the need to segregate and eliminate enemies both within and without the nation. Uh, what he refers to as the America's inner and outer wars. Um, specifically here, he's talking about the intersection by which America um, identifies subject populations both within itself, who must be racially or economically segregated, um, split up, um, or just eliminated, specifically in the case of indigenous groups, um, but also without in imperial holdings in other nations that can be uh, sites of ex material extraction, uh, or kind of rigorously divided um, into good nations and bad nations um, into the alliances and the axes of evil. Um, in spiritual warfare, these general dynamics, this imperial statecraft and this kind of metonym of America um, for humanity as a whole plays out in a series of intertwined narratives related to the war on terror, um, institutional reform, uh, but also the demonization of contemporary protest movements. All of these are worlded, uh, their claims are worlded through the lens of the demonology that we've been analyzing so far. Um, and I'm going to be kind of looking at these three in this order. So, the war on terror. Post 9 11, um, narratives of asymmetric war become a particularly core image to a lot of spiritual warfare discourses. They are virtually um, on. Uh, notice all before this point. However, increasingly, uh, you get ideas of asymmetric warfare, particularly asymmetric warfare um, related to ideas of terrorism, um, being increasingly framed as a lens uh, for demonic rebellion. Uh, the war on terror becomes a lens through which to reread the war in heaven. But at the same time, the war in heaven becomes a lens through which to read the war on terror. Um, there's a, a back and forth that kind of ends up occurring in these discourses. And this is kind of when we're going to be returning to some of the books that I had on one of my initial slides, uh, specifically Stealth Attack and Lucifer's War. Um, because these narratives play out in a series of interconnected ways. For example, uh, Satan becomes framed by Pritchard in Stealth Attack as the first terrorist. Um, and his, his heavenly revolt, the revolt of the angels, becomes the first insurgency. Um, these narratives play out um, through which this kind of lens of asymmetric war and the language of the war on terror is being read um, as a framework to conceptualize the demonic. At the same time, the global war on terror itself uh, is framed as a spiritual battle, as a conflict over ideas of God, over ideological structures that are seen as the result of uh, divine or demonic influence um, over specific regions and specific powers. 
Um, <clears throat> and this is, so one of the more interesting uh, and telling examples of this framework happen is, occurs in Linda Rios Brooks' book, Lucifer's War, um, in which book she, anal she analogizes spiritual warfare to the war in Afghanistan uh, specifically, uh, framing it as a war over views about God. Um, a claim she, she states that the Western powers nervously balk at. Um, so like, within this framework, she does a number of slightly interesting things. Uh, for example, she frames the Afghan population uh, as a metonym for humanity as a whole, uh, that she says are consumed by a conflict they did not invite and for the most part do not understand and that while they are the legal occupants uh, of the territory, here the nation of Afghanistan, uh, they are powerless to summarily dismiss the armies that wage war there. Um, so what is noticeable, of course, here is that she is positioning, um, by positioning the Afghans as humanity, she is positioning uh, the US in the position of divinity and thus of a liberator, of the bringer of truth and of justice. Uh, but also the uh, Muslim terrorists, specifically Al-Qaeda in this context, as demonic, but also notably as outsiders. Um, she is framing uh, any resistance to the US uh, invasion of Afghanistan, the US occupation of Afghanistan, as the result of an outsider influences that are here aligned with, with demonic forces. Um, and it should, of course, be noted here that she is not simply using the war in Afghanistan like as a lens to interpret the war on terror. She is, she is also framing the war on terror and the war in Afghanistan like as a manifestation of spiritual warfare in the physical realm. So these are not just metaphorical relations. Um, what this does, this particular framework and this division of positioning the Afghans as humanity, the US as the angelic or divine forces, and Al-Qaeda as demonic and outsiders, is that she actually subtly delegitimizes any form of Afghan resistance to the occupation. Um, specifically because by doing this, she frames alignments that are like non-US alignments and non-US interests as either directly demonic or as simply human and therefore lacking insight into divine truth. Um, so here you get this framework through which, <clears throat> sorry, through which the US is positioned as uh, a stand-in for divinity, as divine influence, um, and any kind of resistance to US power is being positioned as essentially illegitimate, um, perhaps even as illegal in some cases. Um, what is precisely more interesting about Brooks' framing is that her book is one of the very few that explicitly frames spiritual warfare as colonial. Um, mostly this doesn't directly come up, it's just implied. Uh, but she, she specifically does it, interestingly, in an attempt to exculpate America of having any colonial ambitions in the region. Uh, she writes, unlike the US, uh, God and the devil are both colonizing forces. They both have colonial ambitions for the region. And it's of course notable here that she is of course framing God also as a colonial influence um, rather than just the demonic. Um, but specifically here, um, if we think back to the narratives uh, that we're framing earlier and specifically the way that she's deploying this narrative of insurgency to position uh, active resistance to the US occupation as emerging from an outside, uh, we can see that like, although she's positioning uh, her conception of the demonic here as an outsider colonizing force, they are in fact a manifestation of the ideologies and the beliefs that were already present within the region uh, prior to the US invasion. Um, this generally is a narrative that you'll see play out a lot within spiritual warfare. Um, this, like as we saw earlier, this framing of indigenous powers or regional powers, uh, regional ideologies, as the result of illegal demonic occupancy. Like the demons are always framed as coming from elsewhere, as like not legitimately holding ground. They are, they have squatters rights, as we noted earlier. They are like not the legitimate owners and therefore um, they are being able to be framed here as, as colonizing forces. <clears throat> 
Um, so this is kind of perhaps one of the very key ways that um, the frameworks of US, the US military, of US militarism, becomes re-encoded through these frameworks for spiritual warfare. But overseas influence um, of the US power is not the only place that this plays out. Um, as, a lot of as a lot of academic discussions of the war on terror have made clear, tyranny does come home. And this plays out in the intersecting narratives that we see today around the US state and specifically attempts to reform the US state and um, activist process, protests, particularly grassroots protests. So the first one. The divine calling of the US, the identification of the US like as a chosen nation is often consciously split in these discourses from the US state as an actual institution. Um, this ties broadly into anti-government conspiracy discourse or kind of right-wing libertarian, right-wing discourse about big government broadly in the US. Yeah. The US state is framed as a demonized Leviathan state. Uh, this is a quote from the spiritual warrior, Jonas Clark, um, who kind of frames um, the spirit of Leviathan, who is coded here as an actual demonic entity, as operating behind the scenes like within US power, within the US state. Leviathan here is specifically associated with institutional power. Uh, Leviathan has a very long history of association with state authority. Um, partly this comes from Thomas Hobbes's famous uh, 1651 um, political treatise that was named Leviathan, uh, where the Leviathan stands in as a kind of symbol for political absolutist sovereignty. Uh, but it also has a long, an older history as well. Um, Leviathan, for example, has a long history of identification with Egypt within certain biblical narratives. Um, where Egypt here and Pharaoh are operating as stand-ins for uh, ideas of evil or corrupted sovereignty. Specifically, however, within this contemporary discourse and within this framework, um, Leviathan specifically often operates not just as an image of institutional power, but an image of attempts to alter institutional power, particularly to alter institutional power um, with regards to issues of racial and economic injustice and the restructuring of racial and economic hierarchies within America. Um, specifically groups like uh, Occupy Wall Street in 2012, uh, but also more recently Black Lives Matter or the Movement for Black Lives, which as we'll see very shortly is positioned as um, a kind of demonic threat to a form of white Christian America and sort of construction of white Christian America. One of the key examples of this um, is Lance Wallnau. Lance Wallnau is a Texas Texan-based uh, preacher, very vocal supporter of Donald Trump. Um, he is kind of perhaps most famous for writing a book called God's Chaos Candidate that was published just prior to the 2016 election. Uh, in which he forwards the idea of Donald Trump as a type of the Persian king Cyrus from the Bible. Uh, Cyrus being a Persian ruler who liberated the Jews from Babylon within this context uh, and sort of returned them to, to Israel and set about the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem. Um, within um, evangelical narratives, this idea of Trump as Cyrus has kind of become very, very prominent and very popular, um, partly because it explains why Trump himself does not seem to be particularly overly religious. Um, Cyrus within this framework being a non-believer who was used by God to accomplish providential ends. Uh, so they, so Woolnow and others have kind of analogized Trump to this in the sense that he may not even be a believer, uh, but he is being used by God to further a specific religious and political agenda with which they are aligned. Um, so Woolnow, in uh, an advertisement for his audio series Leviathan, uh, which is a series of sermons in which he talks about um, the spirit, um, claims that Leviathan as a demonic entity is behind the media focus on issues of race, Confederate statues and talk of, with telling use of scare quotes, white supremacy 
uh, and exposes the links, which expose the links between what he says is the, the divisive spirit at work in the 1860s and today, beginning with the riots and demonstrations of the 1960s. Uh, so he is here um, comparing the civil rights movement of the 1960s directly with the Civil War. Um, he's also seemingly engaged in Civil War apologism uh, by claiming that the racial divisions and specifically racial divisions around the perpetuation of white supremacy were related to the um, divisive forces of specific demonic entities, specifically here Leviathan. Um, he then proceeds to um, construct a conspiratorial narrative um, through which uh, activists from the 1960s uh, infiltrate uh, institutions of government in an attempt to change the nation, specifically around uh, journalism, academia, and um, both municipal and federal levels of government. Um, this ties into the kind of broader conspiracy discourses that are very prominent on the right today around uh, not just ideas of political correctness, but sort of more recent uh, narratives about critical race theory that Trump is being pushing, for example. Um, one I think particularly interesting, however, about Wolnau's use of Leviathan in this context is that it actually has precedent. Uh, the historian uh, W. Scott Poole, uh, in his book on Confederate memory in South Carolina, uh, narrates an incident uh, where the Presbyterian divine, uh, David Frierson, uh, invokes the spirit of Leviathan uh, to represent the political changes that were happening during Reconstruction. Uh, specifically, Frierson identified Leviathan as the spirit that ignored precedent and the experience of mankind to remake law in the spirit of the 19th century. Uh, the spirit of the 19th century here representing um, racial reform, uh, like post-Civil War Reconstruction, uh, attempts to basically undermine the white supremacist constitution of the southern states. Uh, so Leviathan is here being positioned as a demonic entity that is related not simply to state power, but to state power that is specifically leveraged um, or cultural power that is specifically being leveraged to reconstruct uh, existing racial and economic hierarchies that privilege whiteness and rich people, often aligned with whiteness. Um, over marginalized groups, particularly like racially marginalized groups. Um, yeah, uh, the divisiveness here that Leviathan is seen to incarnate is specifically a divisiveness that is seen as interfering in ideas of natural racialized economic hierarchy. Um, this ties into uh, broader discourses around um, the new, the kind of reconstruction of hierarchies in America. And this particular framework that is being used in these demonologies of Leviathan plays out very, very specifically in narratives around um, contemporary activist or protest movements, like as the use of Occupy and Black Lives Matter here represents. And it's that that I kind of want to finish uh, by talking about. So the demonologies that we've been kind of looking at so far lend, a, lend support to ideas of to authoritarian consolidation of politics and specifically to racialized notions of law and order. Um, specifically, this is focused more recently around um, narratives of lawlessness. Uh, lawlessness being here tied specifically uh, to ideas of the demonic and to um, ideas of the Antichrist, like as man of lawlessness, as um, the Antichrist is called in the Bible. Uh, and this is kind of something that you can see here in this scene, the pictures that I have up. Uh, these are scenes taken from an evangelical book trailer uh, that is fairly recent. I think the trailer is perhaps a month old. Um, so one of these pictures is from the protests that took place um, in uh, the picture in the upper right is an image of, of the actual protests uh, that is being leveraged in this trailer like as an image of uh, growing anarchy and civil unrest, uh, which they're framing eschatologically and demonologically 
Uh, the other images are entirely staged um, or with actors. Uh, in the first one, um, in the upper left, you have an image of kind of Antifa thugs um, marching ominously towards the camera, um, brandishing flaming torches and flares and baseball bats. Um, uh, the bottom one, uh, which you probably can't tell exactly from uh, the image, uh, is a, an image of a man walking, a silhouette walking ominously towards the camera and then pulling up a hoodie, um, just like overset with a quote from Daniel 8 that is often interpreted in evangelical discourses as about the Antichrist. Uh, so you've got the Antichrist kind of coming up uh, as the man of lawlessness and like pulling on a hoodie um, ominously. Um, so like as a lot of these images kind of hint at, a lot of these discourses around lawlessness like within these demonologies are being focused both on Black Lives Matter, uh, but also on Antifa, uh, which is here processed as like a specific organization rather than a loose affiliation of anti-fascist activists. Um, these become the focus of demonologies of lawlessness. Antifa is, of course, more recent. However, it's worth, of course, stressing, it's worth noting here that demonologies around Black Lives Matter have been a thing on the evangelical right, particularly the white evangelical right, but not exclusively, um, since the movement gained um, prominence within the American media sphere. Um, for example, in 2017, specifically reacting to um, the anti-white supremacist protests in Berkeley uh, late, in, late in December 2016 and then again in March 2017. Uh, Joel Richardson, who is an evangelical prophecy author and the, uh, specifically the author of a New York Times best-selling book titled The Islamic Antichrist, which is an anti-Islam prophecy text that positions Islam as the kind of ultimate eschatological enemy of Christianity, kind of spiritualizing the clash of civilizations narrative. Um, specifically, like Richardson uh, in like refers to a spirit, a satanic spirit of rage um, that he sees as behind uh, quote Ferguson, Berkeley, and that sort of thing. Um, his inclusion of Ferguson here, it should be noted, is completely unbidden. Um, the context in which he's discussing this is not actually related to Ferguson. He simply folds it into this particular narrative that he's trying to tell around protest in America, and specifically around protest against um, uh, racial injustice, uh, police brutality, and white supremacy. Uh, the context of this, he's specifically discussing anti-Trump protests. So exactly why he's folding Ferguson as a representative of an anti-Trump protest is itself quite telling in this context in terms of what he thinks Trump specifically stands for um, in terms of like American political systems. Um, but this narrative was not unique to Richardson. It also played out in a number of other evangelical writers uh, who were writing around, uh, particularly in 2016 and 2017. Um, one of them, uh, John Burton, in an op-ed he wrote for the evangelical magazine Charisma, um, which is a very prominent uh, charismatic evangelical magazine that operates out of Florida. Um, he wrote an article titled, Satan's Grand Strategy and God's Answer to the Black Lives Matter Crisis. Uh, one of the things that comes out in this particular article is that the crisis to which Burton refers is not, say, the crisis of racial injustice or police brutality or of white supremacy in America. It is specifically what he refers to as Satan's strategy of forced sympathy, um, specifically um, empathy across group lines with, what, with, with quote, what is unholy. Uh, specifically, Burton talks about homosexual activism, Black Lives Matter, abortion, and other counter-biblical movements. Um, Specifically here, Burton is constructing this narrative in which affiliation or um, association or empathy across group lines is framed as a form of kind of, of satanic operation. And this ties into a kind of broader narrative around essence that a lot of these groups tell. The idea that um, particularly like one's inner identity, one's essence, particularly uh, as, as a Christian, 
um, is the only legitimate ground for social or political mobilization, uh, in which broad coalitions uh, across group lines, particularly around pragmatic issues or political issues, are often equated with uh, the operations of demonic actors. Um, so here, like alliances between uh, black protest movements, LGBT protest movements, reproductive rights, and others, uh, particularly um, regarding churches that may be supporting these things, which is a particular thing that Burton is very angry about, uh, is positioned as a kind of satanic strategy of um, promoting empathy, essentially. <clears throat> but empathy that is specifically based uh, not on essence, not on a kind of shared communal identity. However, these are early examples. Uh, these are all from 2016 or 2017. Um, this narrative, uh, specifically this narrative that frames uh, the movement for black lives as influenced by demonic forces has been kicked into overdrive in evangelical circles like since the protest sparked by the murder of George Floyd. Um, so the last few months, you've seen a lot of uh, discourse within evangelical circles that are claiming that Black Lives Matter is a specifically demonically influenced force, and therefore its movement uh, for racial justice in America is a kind of demonic ploy aimed at undermining a very specific kind of white Christian structure of influence and power. And this narrative tends to hinge on a few um, common um, points. Uh, one is uh, the Black Lives Matter support for LGBT people. It's founded by queer black activists, so this is not surprising. Um, but specifically, this folk, the, uh, allow, the uh, alignment with LGBT causes is positioned as a source of demonic influence. Um, the second one is its diverse spiritual roots. Um, actually, probably the second is its like uh, affiliation with Marxism. Uh, which is framed within these structures as uh, demonically influenced, um, drawing on kind of earlier like red scare rhetoric around that. Uh, but the third one, um, the one that's particularly gained a lot of prominence recently, uh, is related to the diversity of spiritualities that exist within the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, there's been several recent like very good pieces of writing um, on the kind of broad base of different spiritual traditions that are operating within uh, the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, but specifically here, um, there is a focus within evangelical literature on framing Black Lives Matter as a source of, of demonic, as driven by a kind of demonic witchcraft, or specifically demonic necromancy. Um, this is related specifically to uh, the affiliation by several founders uh, with particular like West African forms of spirituality, uh, particularly the Yoruba tradition of Ifa uh, is one that gains a particular amount of attention uh, within these frameworks. Uh, and we can kind of see here this repetition of the earlier structures that I kind of talked about in part one uh, regarding this kind of coding of non-evangelical religious and spiritual traditions um, as demonic and as like sources of demonic power, but also, of course, the echo of those discourses around Haiti we saw earlier, um, where slave revolts and broadly movements against kind of white supremacist subjugation are framed as uh, disruptions in cosmic order and tied to kind of demonic influence. Uh, one of the core parts that I've seen from both evangelical but also some conservative Catholic commentators within this discourse is the idea that particularly the say her name and say his name chants, which recite the names of victims of police brutality and white supremacist violence, um, are essentially forms of kind of necromantic invocation uh, that summon forth demonic spirits. Uh, so there is this implicit alignment here uh, between uh, murdered black people and demonic entities that are being kind of summoned um, in order to kind of affect transformation and uh, yeah, shifting patterns of like racial hierarchy in America, uh, disruptions of white supremacy. Um, yeah, 
So the ultimate kind of takeaway from these kind of discourses is this idea that challenges to a particularly like white Christian notion of America operates as a challenge to, to narratives of divine order, uh, to cosmic order itself, to the kind of teleological and developmental history um, of contemporary America, but also the West broadly considered. And I think uh, that is where I am going to end for now. Um, so uh, this is a final page that is around my book, uh, which is coming out, which deals with a lot of, not some of the more recent stuff, particularly the older stuff that we talked about in part one is discussed in a lot more depth here, uh, but also some of the 2016 discourses around Black Lives Matter and uh, framings of Leviathan in relation to the state. So that is where I will end. Um, how am I doing for time? Okay. <laughs>